O come thou wisdom from on high. God is the source of our life in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification, redemption. Eternal God, your word of wisdom goes forth and does not return empty. Grant us such knowledge and love of you that we may perceive your presence in all creation and every creature. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns now and forever. A reading from the book of Ruth. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I need to seek some security for you, so that it may be well with you. Now here is our kinsman, Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the thresh threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women, women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without next of kin, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. The word of the Lord. What did you hear? You notice that we skipped a section here in the book of Ruth, which just kind of gets a little steamy. But <laughs> what do we know about the book of Ruth? Monica. Ruth was from Moab, but in spite of that, she would not leave Naomi going home to Bethlehem. So she became one in Israel and she bore a son who was, became the part of the genealogy of Jesus. What are some of the, the themes of the book? I'll give you a hint. God doesn't show up at all in this book with the Bible, so you know, it's very interesting. I, I don't know what the themes are. I don't know the book well enough, but I do know that a lot of it, and this is an indication, just has to do with the ties between high spirits and ordinary day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And it, really, it comes through strongly, and it comes through strongly. Ruth is still talked about often even in the women's movement today and the, the biblical circle so mm -hmm. thank you Others. a theme is loyalty ruth was really loyal to naomi yeah. and she was also loyal in the field of boaz because they were allowed to pick up the 
wheat that was left over mm -hmm. and she was very conscious of doing that. She was very, very um, good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, it's, 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 it's really marvelous. But, you know, I don't think that the name of God is mentioned, mm -hmm. but God's all the way through it. Right. It becomes a bit of a test for us to sort of find God present in a story where you know God isn't explicitly mentioned. Yeah. What was that, Brendan? What did you think you asked? God all the way through. Oh, you're right. You're probably right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I love it when I'm wrong. <laughs> Others. Um, I've just um, noticed that this is probably one of the books in the Bible where the relationship between a mother and a, a daughter is so emphasized. I guess the only other place I think of a relationship between two women is with Mary and Elizabeth, but yeah. it's just a lovely, lovely story. I mean, just the, the thought that the mother-in-law would look after Ruth to make sure she bore a son. Of course, that was good for Ruth, uh, for Naomi as well, but it just... Uh, you just see that real love and bonding between the two of them. It's a beautiful story. Thank you. I agree. It's a great portrait of, of, um, of love between these two women. Yeah. Others? I've just, um, I just want to make a comment. Ruth and Anne were good friends. Yes. Anne was Jesus' um, mother. So I wonder how both women tie in their lives with the presence of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And um, I wish I have had more time to research more of the uh, subject matter that you're speaking of, you know. Um, but... Uh, you know, I've been studying the women in the Bible, and, and it's quite profound. I just wonder if there are more passages that I'm not aware of. But um, I think uh, these two women were uh, um, uh, first in his life, hmm. you know. Yeah, they're mentioned in the genealogy. I mean, you know, there's this whole genealogy of Jesus, right? And the women that are mentioned are particularly to be paid attention to. Let us continue by attending to the psalm, number 127. Our second reading comes from the book of Hebrews. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. 
nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that, the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. The word of the Lord. What did you hear? I like this passage because it tackles the problem of time. <laughs> and uh, I think that's one of the things that we come up against as we, as we approach you know, our seasons of celebration in the year is, is this the first time or the last time? <laughs> or the, which time is this you know, that we're hoping for the birth of Christ? And um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm really clear on it still, <laughs> but I like that, that he approached that kind of issue. Thank you. Yeah, time is a flat circle or something. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's kind of layers or something. Yes. Others? I just am really struck by the language um, in the verse 24, the first verse in this pericope, uh, a sanctuary made by human hands um, and a mere copy of the true one, because this is a language that we use, that is used in sort of the theology of icons and resistance to icons as idols and idolatry. And the, the sort of what is going on in an icon? Is it the real thing? Is it a copy of the real thing? And the, the, the orthodox theology is that this is a proto, this is a mediating tool that um, mediates our prayers and devotions to the prototype, to the real thing. And is thinking of Christ as not just a copy of God. That's really um, an interesting, we need to be clear on that. <laughs> Uh, that Christ is not a copy of God. It's, it's not a, um, just an imprint of God in human form. Thank you. Thank you. We exist in time and space. We live moment to moment, but we're always thinking about the past or the future to get us focused on that moment is for me at least so very hard. There are churches in and around the Holy Land that commemorate certain moments in Jesus' life because such and such a thing was said to have ha happened there. I particularly like the one where Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether it happened there or not, but it, those places help me to get centered on that moment to actually while I'm, I am thinking about the past, it helps me connect a little bit with eternity. And so too with these passing the seasons and the, the candles. Yes, it happened thousands of years ago, but it, doing this thing helps us to connect with eternity by being in the moment, which is unlike the past and the future, the thing that is most like eternity in our experience. same lines and um, again the first the first sentence struck me as well um, I had the privilege of visiting in Jerusalem um, the temple and going into there and going deep down where some of the original parts of the temple were and I, I that was incredibly moving to me and then I thought 
and that is just made by mere hands. Imagine what the real thing is going to be like, what the real deal will be like. So it just struck me that that was so awe-inspiring, and it, I think it does center us, but it's just, um, it's, it's like the icon. It's just a, a, a foreshadowing of what is to come. I was particularly struck by the words now to appear in the presence of God on mm -hmm. our behalf. And it's almost like that eternal now. Um, that, and, and it's what we actually place our faith in, that Jesus is, is interceding continuously before the throne of God, God the Father. Mine's really a question of time. I, I'm confused by this passage because it mentions the second coming of the second coming. Yeah. So it's really the third coming. <laughs> or what is it? I, I mean, right. it's actually pretty interesting. I never, I never even encountered that idea before until mm -hmm. seeing this. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, so I'm, I'm, my clock's gone on, went backwards. Or, I know, it's leap year. Okay. Thank you. Ideology is an absolutely wonderful topic to talk about. You know, um, there's many ways. There's a physical ideology, ideology, and yet, you know, there's a picture that you cherish holds that same principle because you know it's a suggestion you're not worth with them. And if you can go one step further and you can see that that was just the space it was holding but in actual fact there is a connection that actually happens you know if you um like some people feel that the cross is an, is is a, a symbol of ideology uh, and that's just lack of education or just a refusal to accept some of the greatest masters on the world that ever lived. Um, and even uh, a wonderful figurine. Uh, someone gave me a small figurine of Jesus Christ and the baby in the, in, in, in the saddle. And um, it was wonderful. I, it's something I would never buy myself, but it was just only this big, you know? And I thought, what a reminder of what, an, what a statue can do. Right. And, and the statues have been through the Catholic Church for centuries and centuries. And, and uh, you know, I mean, you can, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, a little statue of some kind can actually put you into reminding you who you truly are in your real nature. In case you have a chance, like Brandon says, it's hard to stay in the moment completely 24-7. Right. So looking at that brings you right back into a place where you can just, okay, I'm with you on this one, you know? And it's, yeah. it's, it's a wonderful thing, and that might come in a form of something that is so obscure, you just might not understand it right away, you know? And there's a wonderful uh, picture of the earth. Uh, and, you know, this is something that we don't see very often. Yeah. But in addressing its picture, you realize how incredible the earth is. Yeah. And that is a symbol of ideology as to how we worship the symbols that protect it and bring us abundance and, and all the great things that are in store in God's world. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. yeah. The picture you're talking about is, is, I think, of the Earth. It was taken from space. And, yeah. and it was actually one of the major impetuses for the whole environmental movement, actually. It had a huge impact on the world's imagination. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let us rise and greet the gospel.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing for the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. <clears throat> this is one of those easy sermons that writes itself, correct? I mean, the whole point is to say, with fancy words and poignant examples, religious hypocrites are bad and generous poor people are good. Double points if you use the story as a jumping off point for stewardship education and development. It goes something like this. Unlike other institutions, the church cares about the intention of your gift and the sacrificial nature of your contribution. So even if you can't afford to give us enough money to build a new education wing, please give until it hurts, because it's good for you. I am exaggerating for effect, of course, but I promise you many stewardship sermons are based on this text essentially boil down to something like, give like the widow, because it's good for you. And in the polite, respectable mainline churches like ours, the benefit is expressed in spiritual or psychological terms. Think of the stewardship Sundays in which witnesses will relate firsthand how giving benefited them. It made them feel good to know that their gift helped others, or it made them feel good to be connected to the mission and ministry of the church in a new way. Other traditions will be even bolder and talk about how, because of their financial gift, they are receiving as much again in this life, houses and families and money, for their tithes. They teach that God will bless you with material wealth if you give what you have to the church. In fact, they even appropriate the language of investment to talk about seed gifts. And it's so easy to be critical of the prosperity gospel churches with their private jets and mansions. But before we go picking the speck out of their eye, we might want to look at the log in our own. You see, I think we are more often like the scribes in this story than the widow, certainly more than we like to admit. They don't mean to be self-righteous or exploitive. No doubt they would defend themselves by pointing to all the good works that the temple was doing at the time. They're just cogs in a much bigger system after all. Heat the game, not the player. And they may have a point that Jesus was criticizing an unjust system more than individual behaviors, perhaps, but that through righteous sacrifice, we could give up our place of honor and elevate the downtrodden and thus slide the scale from scribe to widow. But my concern with the scribe's bad widow's good reading is in the first place is in the first place still stands which is that reducing stewardship or fundraising to a transactional exchange with god rather misses the point it's not about earning stickers on a cosmic star chart or progressing through the greater stages of psychological detachment or becoming less hypocritical this story isn't even about the benefits of not being materialistic it's about reassessing where value is to be found in the first place what really has value in the economics of the kingdom where Jesus is king? You see, as tempting as it is to see ourselves oscillating along the spectrum of scribe and widow, the truth is that we are neither of those characters in this story, because the story is not about us at all. It's about Jesus. We aren't the widow. We aren't the scribe. We are the coin. 
Consider this. The next two verses after the gospel passage we read today go like this. Quote, As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. In Mark's gospel, Jesus has foreknowledge of the destruction of the temple, which will happen in 70 AD. It's still a few decades away in the narrative timeline of the Gospel of Mark, but it was on the top of mind for the community that wrote this book and who heard it read in the first century of the Jesus movement. It's difficult to understate the national trauma of the siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. The ancient historian Josephus wrote that 1.1 million Jewish people were killed. Another source of the time says that 97,000 people were taken into slavery. And even if you discount these numbers as being literary exaggeration, the descriptions from multiple other accounts make it clear that this was an exceedingly awful massacre. In fact, it was so bad that the Romans decided not to have a traditional military parade known as a triumph because there was no honor in such a lopsided bloodbath. I'm just saying that to explain how, from the perspective of the original audience of the gospel, how truly meaningless these few coins are. The poor widow is supporting an institution that, according to Jesus, is both hopelessly corrupt and doomed to destruction. There is no value in this gift, at least not if it is measured by the rulers of this world, social impact and return on investment. Fun fact, I've had to document in the past the social impact of the food bank, and it always bugs me that so, so much of it seems to come down to counting heads, how many households, how many pounds of food, and so on, as though that was the most important thing. And I'm not saying that it isn't important, but I would love to fill out one of these reports where they ask about how many friendships were formed, or how much dignity was restored, or how much less alone people feel when they come together in this way. But that's not how this world calculates value, at least not for any of the grants that I've received. In contrast, the gift that the widow has has zero positive social impact from the perspective of the gospel. Just another widow having her house devoured by the scribes. She might as well have lost these coins in the cushions of her bed. And this, beloved, is where the hopey changey part comes in. It's only when we accept the true poverty represented here, the truly corrupt and dying nature of anything that mankind has created, the subtle sins of even the most commendable efforts. It's only once we accept that nothing we do is going to save that temple, that we, see Jesus is up, that we can see what Jesus is up to. He's not interested in the widow or the temple. He's interested in sacrifice. He's interested in the fact that she has given everything, all she had to live. And he's interested in that because he's about to do the exact same thing. Like the widow, Jesus will throw everything he has into God's treasury, his life, and by the extension of baptism, our own. He knows this world is corrupt and that we are sinners, and he tosses it all in. He doesn't try to fight the Romans or keep the temple going for another year or try to heal all the blind people in Jerusalem. He's not interested in social impact or community building here. He's about his father's work of flipping the whole table of exchange over and over in the air until the whole system collapses and something else matters. In the economics of God's kingdom, we don't buy our way into salvation or wisdom or enlightenment through prudent spiritual investments. We don't do good to be good to have good. How could we when like the temple, our bodies are also doomed to destruction? No, we are not the widow, and we're not the scribe. Remember the story of another widow who found a lost coin? That's us, the coin, that made her rejoice. Or the story about the prodigal son and the father who throws a completely crazy party for him when he comes home. We are the son, and the party is for us. Time and again, we find in Scripture the notion that God's generosity is extravagant beyond any human measure and that it is totally incomparable to anything we might do to prompt it. So yes, by all means, support the work of the church, this flawed temple with its scribes in rich robes. Support the food bank and the worship that we do and all the other things that are part of this place. But do so understanding that what God values most is you. Not what you do, not what you give, you. God loves you and he purchased your salvation with the gift of himself, of infinite value offered once in 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, as I do, I'll open this up for any thoughts or reflections. Might, the temple, that's good stuff. Thank you, John. Um, it's interesting that you combine both words, um, poverty and um, wealth. Our sense of what poverty is is not based on dollars. It's the poverty of the soul. And the, the acceptance to start life all over again, because that's what a lot of people have to do, me included, you know? You have to reorganize your life and start all over again. And it's a refreshment of the parchment and a refreshment of the fulfillment. So I think it's, you know, if you look around at what's happening in other places all around the world, their idea of poverty is very different than our idea of poverty. Yeah. You know, as I watch something on television, there was a young man that lives in uh, Nigeria, and he would go out and fish every day. And so these are people who haven't got that sense of what we have, which is, you know, um, uh, money itself. And even though you can give them money to start their programs, they still don't have the education to actually do anything with it. Whereas in this country, there are a tremendous amount of supports to help those out of that very um, difficult, whether it's wealth or not, the, the programs available to us to transcend it and to go beyond it. Yeah. Very fortunate, thank you. I think what you say is challenging because um, I want to put myself in the place of the f judging the Pharisees or coming alongside the woman and pretending that I'm like him. But I think what it calls for is this relationship, which is far deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's intimidating at some level. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I didn't come up with this image of us being the coin. That was um, Emily Towns I actually came up with that. Uh, but one of the things that struck me in her writing about it was that it sort of decenters it from being about us in a way, but also challenges us, as you said. You know, if one thing it challenges us to imagine that we are in the possession of God somehow, and that God sort of spends us, right? Which is a fascinating concept. Um, yeah, no, it's very challenging. Thank you, Jen. Because I write a lot of grants, and and I review a lot of grants, and when I review a grant that is um, very responsible, very incremental, and, and, and has all the data to back that up. It's, it's all good, but it's not very inspiring. Mm -hmm. But when I read a grant that has that in there, because you need that, but has an overarching vision of why are we doing this and why is it important, that's what gets it over the top. And I think that's a lot, I think there's a parallel there with our faith, you know, if, whether it be are we just checking boxes? Are we just doing these things because we're told to do them and therefore that makes us uh, a good Christian? Or are we really trying to get that bigger vision of why we're here and that we are loved? And actually the love part, recognizing that you're loved, that's I think the hardest lesson, at least for me, the hardest lesson of all, to really absorb that is really tough. Thanks, John. Th th this passage and in your sermon uh, makes me think about um, the Lord's Prayer, where we just ask for our daily bread. I think it's meaningful that we don't ask for enough food 
like for the month for all of Advent or the <laughs> month of November. And um, when Jesus was anointed, um, and I think it was Judas, if I remember correctly, who said that the the oil or the perfume could have been used for the poor. Mm -hmm. I I think of and and this and how we're told to you know if someone asks for something to give it. I think about the condition the widow was left in, which was nothing for the day really or for the rest of days but for the Lord to provide mm -hmm. and how when I only give part of something I have my time or some small amount of money I'm I'm hedging my bet because I believe that I'm going to be left responsible for my own welfare instead of um, understanding that it whatever I give it's I'm just changing myself from being a temporary trustee to whomever I give it to mm. so mm. thank you yeah the, it goes back to time in a way doesn't it like you you sort of mentioning about you know giving the bread for today and the time was such a theme that you all pulled out from the earlier passages it's fascinating uh, yeah I agree there's The fact that the widow gave the money probably did more for her than for the people that she was giving it to because she would make uh, that would uh, when we do something and sacrifice then it seems that we make a jump in our uh, spiritual growth. Mm. You know, so often you want to know what happened next to these characters. <laughs> yeah. That's Brendan. Thank you. But well, we know what happened next. This happened next. <laughs> the, the, the two coins, this. Yeah. Just what you said. And, and we're talking about this woman... 2,000 years later, those two coins self-evidently <laughs> made a vastly greater impact than all the money that was ever given that year or that decade to the temple. It just, those two coins changed the way we think about the universe. Mm -hmm. So, I'll have to but, revise my sermon. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, which is you say a connection, you know, to the the greater uh, the greater world that we know as our universe. Yeah. Right. That goes back to the relationship point that was made at the beginning of the comment period. Anyone else? Wonderful. Will we continue our, our worship with the prayers of the people. Please rise as you are able. In joyful expectation, let us pray to our Savior and Redeemer, saying, Lord Jesus, come soon. O wisdom from the mouth of the Most High, you reign over all things to the ends of the earth. Come and teach us how to live. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come soon. Lord God, you see into our hearts. Illuminate for us the yearning for you that underlies all the busyness and preoccupations of our daily lives. Help us to see that that yearning is your presence in our souls, teaching us to wait patiently for you. Make this Advent season one that welcomes you more deeply into our lives. Come and teach us how to live. Lord Jesus, come soon. Lord, we spend our lives waiting and hoping, waiting and hoping for love, for friendship, for promotions, for an end to violence, for an end to COVID restrictions, for Christmas, for time to be with family and friends, 
Teach us that all these desires are really a pale reflection of our waiting and hoping for you. Help us to find you in unease, discomfort, and even pain. Lighting us a desire to prepare for your coming, to stand in the darkness waiting for your coming with joyful hope. Come and teach us how to live. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come soon. Lord, as these early days of Advent begin, help us to believe that you know what we need. Give us the courage to listen to your voice and the freedom to open our hearts to the graces you are offering us. Help us to place our trust in you. Come and teach us how to live. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. soon. Lord Jesus, in the darkness of these long Advent nights, let us be guided by the light of your word. Give us the humility to be led by you and the wisdom to learn from you. As we feel our hearts stir in anticipation, let us sense that you are inviting us to enter more deeply into the mystery of your birth. In the spirit of the season, let our waiting and our patience feel sacred. Come and teach us how to live. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come soon. This week, with other congregations, we pray for all those Christians who are persecuted around the world for their belief in you. Bring them the peace and the hope that is the sign of your advent. Come and teach us how to live. Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus, come, come soon. soon. O wisdom from the mouth of the Most High, you reign over all things to the ends of the earth. Come and teach us how to live. Lord when Jesus, Jesus come soon. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. Please join me as you are able.
those who are baptized in any tradition are welcome to receive communion at Christ's table. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, so that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. You are worthy of blessing and praise, O God of our salvation. You speak and creation comes to life. You breathe and we are filled with your spirit. You come with healing on your wings. You loosen the bonds of sickness to let the oppressed go free. You shelter the poor and feed the hungry the bread of life. And when the night is darkest, you break upon us like the dawn, and your touch makes us rise. Now we give you thanks that you have shown the greatness of your love by sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our fragile flesh and to bear our every burden. Your Son, Jesus, did not turn his face from shame and loss, but took up our suffering and death. He suffers with the sick, the injured, and the dying. By his passion and death, he rescues us from evil and binds up every wound. On the night before his suffering and death, Jesus shared supper with his friends. He blessed bread, broke it, and gave it to them and said, this bread is my body, given for you and for all humankind to make covenant between us. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Then he blessed the wine and said, this is the cup of life my blood poured out for all, making covenant between us. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Now, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the healing power of your Son, by whose wounds we are healed. Give us your power so that we may praise you and bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, Lord our God. We celebrate the healing power of Jesus' cross and empty tomb and these gifts of bread and wine. Now send your spirit upon us, upon them, to show us his life-giving body and blood. May Christ, the risen Son, rise in us and make us one with you, one with each other, and one with all creation. Even now, Christ stands with us, and in his presence we see the new day, where the darkness of our pain is changed into the light of your kingdom, where with Gregory of Nyssa, with Mary, Jesus' mother, and Luke, the physician, and with all the saints and angels, we join in the triumphant song. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
radiant God. With our eyes we have seen your salvation, and in this meal we have feasted on your grace. May your word take flesh in us, so that we may be your holy people, revealing your glory made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Uh, a couple of quick uh, announcements. Um, Sarah, do you want to announce about your uh, concert coming up? Thank you very much. Um, yes, the Summerhill Orchestra is back in business. Um, at least the strings are. And we started rehearsing and we're, we're presenting a concert of string orchestra music on November 29th. It's a Monday night at 8 o'clock. And we, are, we can't use this space as usual, so we're moving over to Rosedale United Church. And all of the tickets are sold on Eventbrite this time. We don't have any physical tickets to sell here. So if you have any questions, please feel free to come and talk to me. Okay, wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great concert. Um, other announcements. Um, Trent, do you want to uh, talk about the food bank uh, project? There's, there's a, in your region, there's a ghost, uh, um, there's a ghost that has been there for a Maybe just show, what is the best way for people to make this donation? It's actually because we're trying to get it on the other side of the line without something the same. So we're taking on the very good thing to do that. We can do that in the offering plate or on the website. Yeah, just if you put it in the offering plate, just make sure it's designated for the food bank so that we know uh, what it's for. Um, are there other announcements for the congregation? Yeah, we should continue to pray for all of our, of our leaders. Thank you. Yeah. Are there other announcements for the mission? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Thanks, Jared. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else? All right. In that case, let us uh, return to our seats as we listen to our final hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Christ Jesus, the splendor of the Father and the image of his being, draw you to himself, that you may live in his light and share in his glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus, Him. Yeah.